to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ of david god said i have found david the son of jesse a man after my own heart who will perform all my will. Acts chapter 13, verse number 22. We welcome you today to our study of great Bible characters. And today we're thinking about one of the great characters of the Old Testament, King David. David was a great man of God for the most part who did good things for God's kingdom and received one of the great compliments by God, a man after my own heart. 1 Samuel 13 uh, teaches that as well as Acts 13 verse 22. And so we welcome you today to our study of great Bible characters. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us. We want to ask you to get your Bible and have it ready, locate it, have it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God together today in our study. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night, you'd be an honored guest at any of their services. You'll find friendly people there who are concerned about souls and who want the Word of God to be foremost in your life. And so stop by and visit the Church of Christ in your area. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you've got a Bible question, something you've been studying or thinking about, contact us and we'd be glad to help you with that. You can write to us or call us, email us at the information given, and we'll be happy to help you with that. And also, we want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, we have a wide variety of good Bible study material on every book of the Bible and a vast uh, library of topical subjects as well. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on DVD or CD form, you can go to our website, fill out a media request form, and we'll make that available to you free of charge. Or we also make available digital downloads that you can receive on a computer, a smartphone, or a smart TV as well, free of charge also. And so check that out if you would. Would also check out our apps in the uh, Android and Apple Play stores. The Gospel of Christ app is available free of charge as well. And that's a great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world today. We're thinking about today the individual who we often refer to as King David in the Bible. Here's what led to David being put in as king. Because of Saul's unlawful sacrifice that he made in 1 Samuel 13 and his failure to obey God's command found in 1 Samuel 15, God began looking for a replacement to King Saul. 1 Samuel 13, verse number 14. David, in Samuel's estimation, was probably the most unlikely of the sons of Jesse uh, for, to replace King Saul for God. 1 Samuel 16 verses 1 through 13 recounts that. And yet it was David who was chosen. His life and his work covers a large amount of biblical literature. The life of David can be found in 1 Samuel 16 through 31, and all of 2 Samuel 1 Kings chapters 1 and 2, and 1 Chronicles chapters 11 through 29, and a large part of the book of Psalms. And so what we want to do today is let's notice the good, the bad, and the ugly in David's life, and let's make practical application to our lives today as well. Just give you a little biographical information about David to lead us into his life. David was of the tribe of Judah, which would be the kingly tribe, Genesis 49, 
uh, verse 10. He was a son of Jesse, a descendant of Boaz uh, from the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, and 1 Chronicles 2, verses 3 through 17. David and his family were of the town of Bethlehem in Judah, according to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. King David had eight wives that we know of, 1 Chronicles 3, verses 1 through 9, and 1 Samuel 18, verse 27 teaches that. He had 19 sons and one daughter mentioned in 1 Chronicles 3. David also had children from his concubines who were not given any specific details about, according to 1 Chronicles 3, verse 9. And yet David although did some things that weren't right in God's sight, for the most part, he tried to live a life that was according to the will of God. He reigned for about 40 years, from about 1050 to about 1010, according to 1 Chronicles 3, verse 4. That was a 40-year period. And when we think of things that kind of effortless for David's life, statements he's remembered for, uh, they're following are four epithets that we remember from David's life. He was known as a mighty man of war, according to 1 Samuel 16, verse 18, because more than any other king, he ran out and he defeated and he uh, wiped out the heathen nations, which is what God wanted them to do. He's known as the sweet psalmist of Israel, 2 Samuel 23, verse 1, and he wrote a plethora of, of the Psalms that are found in the book of Psalms. He's also known for this phrase, you are the man. 2 Samuel 12 verse 7, identifying him when he was in sin and wrong by Nathan the prophet. And then probably the most well-known statement about David is, a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14, and Acts confirms in Acts 13, 22 that that applied to David. Uh, David died in old age for the most part as a man of God. In fact, it's his reign that actually becomes the criterion by which all other kings are judged in the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Now let's direct our attention to the good that David did. Then we'll talk a little bit about the bad and the ugly as well from his life. Some of the good things David did. Probably one of the least mentioned good things that David did is that he was willing to spare Saul's life when on numerous occasions he could have taken it. David, according to 1 Samuel 16, David had already been appointed by God as king over Israel. And yet David would not rise up and take that mantle away from Saul because he revered him as God's anointed. 1 Samuel 24, 6 and 1 Samuel 26, verse 9. From this we learn that David showed great respect and reverence for holy things, uh, the position of the king, that which God utilized at that time was something that David realized was from God, was given by God, and it was not a position to be taken lightly, and he had great respect and reverence for holy things given by God. What a great lesson for us today. Like David, we need to have that same respect and reverence for holy things, for the Lord Jesus Christ, for His church, for worship, for Christian living, for godly parents, for the home as God designed it between one man and one woman for life. We need to show great respect and reverence. Don't treat it as a common thing. Not something to be laughed at or made jokes about. Not something to be looked down on or belittled. Hold it up in high esteem. Reverence it in your life and your actions and show great respect for God and the things He puts in place. Another really good thing that we remember about King David and, and what he's probably best known for is his defeat of the ungodly giant Goliath. You remember 1 Samuel chapter 17, right? God, uh, the army of God is encamped against the army of the Philistines and there is this giant 
by the name of Goliath who comes out every day and he basically taunts and makes fun of the people of God. If there's anybody over there who can come and take me, he says, come and take me. And he laughs at him and mocks him and they all run in terror and tremble at his feet as it were. And yet David, a little shepherd boy, he hears this giant taunting the people of God and because he loves God, he basically says, I'm not taking that. I'm going to do something about it. And so he gets Saul's armor, tries to put it on, and it's so huge he can't wear it. He can't carry a sword. And yet, with what he's got, he takes a slingshot and some stones. He goes up against this giant. The giant laughs at him and mocks him. David slings that slingshot around and sends one stone into that man's head. And drops him like a rock. Takes his sword, cuts off his head. He, a little shepherd boy who couldn't even wear the armor of a soldier defeated the great giant Goliath. This lesson shows us the courage David had and his confidence in the deep abiding trust and help of God in his promises. Did God promise his people, they would defeat the enemy? Absolutely. Did God promise He would be with them? You bet He did. Did God say that nothing would rise up against them, that they couldn't defeat with His help? Sure He did. Over and over again He said that. And David believed it. What about us today? Do we have the courage and the trust in God and His promises to move forward and do His will regardless of how big the obstacles or the giants may be? I love these words. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says this, Let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For the Lord Himself has said, I will never, listen to this, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And so when we think about David, great, great man of courage in defeating that giant Goliath. And friend, whatever giant there may be in your life, we know with, with God, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. We also know this. David, due to his faithfulness, he received the seed promise of which ultimately Christ fulfilled. 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 through 14, God said to David, there will not, uh, uh, one would sit on his throne of his seed over the kingdom of Israel, they would reign forever. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, that isn't fulfilled until your seed is identified as Christ. Galatians 3, 15, and of Jesus it is said in Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, he'll be called great, the Son of God, high, Lord God highest. Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and of his kingdom there'll be no end. The ultimate fulfillment of that great promise, in part due to David's faithfulness, is the seed of Jesus Christ came through with him. What a great honor that was. What else do we see from David's life that was good? On one account, David showed great kindness to even his enemy's son. Mephibosheth, the uh, son of Jonathan, which would be Saul's grandson, in part, you know, because of the things Saul had done, kind of put them at odds at some times. And yet, after Jonathan dies, Mephibosheth is actually uh, handicapped, we might say, and David brings him in, lets him eat of his table, brings him into his house. In 2 Samuel 9, you can read about that. And, and although that would have been a tense situation in some ways, David showed great kindness to Mephibosheth. And that, and that kind of shows the heart of David. Doesn't that remind us of what our Lord taught us? Love your enemies. Do good to those who uh, spitefully use you and abuse you and take advantage of you. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Uh, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 11. And so Christians, we're to be a people of kindness. Even to those who may not deserve that or who may not be kind toward us, we need to be that way toward them. David, some of the good things he did was he was a prophet of God. 
and he wrote many of the Psalms of the Old Testament. Uh, 2 Samuel 23, 2, it is said, uh, David said, His word was upon my tongue. David was inspired, an inspired prophet of God, and as such, when I read the book of Psalms, I'm reminded of the power of that literature. You remember Psalms like Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still rivers. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. How many times has that psalm, or ones like it, encouraged and uplifted us? My well, friend, David utilized, God used David, and utilized David in the writing of those, and again, in part because of who he was and his faithfulness. But you know, as I think about David, and we're going to talk about this a little more, when it comes to the bad, but here's one of the good things about David. When David did sin, like we all do, Romans 3 verse 23, he was willing to repent and turn from that sin. You read Psalm 51 and David says, I, I repent basically in sackcloth and ashes. I've sinned against you. Uh, make, make me new, basically, David will say. When he found sin in his life, he was willing to repent and turn to God. Now let's think about some of the things David did that were not good. Let's talk a little bit about the bad that David did in his life. One of the things we know that David did that was contrary to the will of God is that he multiplied wives for himself, which was not according to the original plan of Genesis 2 verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And which was a violation of what God told the kings. Look in your Bible in Deuteronomy 17, verse 17. Deuteronomy 7, it was, God did not want the kings to have a multiplicity of wives. The multiplying of those wives was against the will of God. Look in Deuteronomy 17, verse 17. The Bible says, Neither shall he multiply, talking to the king, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And so the, the idea that all these wives that they had, were just, that wasn't God's will. Does God allow people to do things sometimes that aren't, according to His will, and not immediately stop that? Yeah. And we know in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, God overlooked in the sense of didn't immediately punish that. God once overlooked sin, now commands all men everywhere, winked at sin, now commands all men everywhere to repent of it. But the multiplying of these wives, and especially as Solomon sees that and does that, it did eventually lead to his downfall and something that should not have been done. What else did David do that was bad? David transported the ark of God in an unauthorized way, which led to Uzzah's death. Let me, let me remind you of the story of that. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, you've got the people of God, David and the people of God, taking the ark of God back from the enemies. They don't want it, so they send it back, and David takes it back. And the Bible says this, And they put the ark of God on a new cart, and as they're transporting it back, they came to a place called Nashon's threshing floor. And probably like a lot of our roads, had a pothole in it maybe. And as they crossed that and hit that rough spot in the road, the ark of God begins to look like it's going to fall. And the Bible says, as it's on that new cart, Uzzah and Ohio are driving it, as it were. And Uzzah reaches out to stabilize. He loves the ark of God. He knows what it means. The last thing he wants is for it to fall. His motives, no doubt, are good. He reaches out and touches the ark of God and immediately dies. And David becomes angry, the Bible tells us. But as he looks back on that, he learned a powerful lesson. Look in your Bible, if you would. And I want you to see what David learned and what we can learn uh, from that account as well of David transporting the ark of God in an unauthorized way. Look in your Bible, if you would, in 1 Chronicles chapter... <clears throat> I want you to look in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. And I want you to notice what the Bible says here. David now thinks back about this event, and here's what David comes to conclusion of. He says, Of this event, for because you did not do it the first time, 
the Lord our God broke out against us, listen to this, because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priest and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the Lord bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, listen now, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. What did David do that was bad? We did not consult him about the proper order. As Moses had already commanded, there were already instructions given in the book of Numbers, Numbers 5, and other places. And so there was a way to transport it. God had told them. And when they went and got it, they just went and got it. They didn't even think about that. And so people, Uzzah died because of that. And David got angry, but he realized eventually he didn't have anybody to be angry about ex at except himself. And so he did things at times that were not authorized, but at least he did learn from that. Now for the remainder of our time, Let's think about the ugly in David's life. And friend, we all sin. We all fall short. We all have times in our life that are not pretty. And David had some of those as well. But he learned from them, and we can learn from them also. Probably the ugliest event in David's life is his sin with Bathsheba. In 2 Samuel 11, at a time when kings ought to be out at war, David's up on the rooftop. He sees Bathsheba bathing, beautiful to behold. He lusts after her in his heart. As king, he can have anything he wants, so he takes her, brings them to him, he has relations with her, and come to find out, she gets pregnant over that. And so David now doesn't know what to do. Her husband is a great warrior of his in the army, so he calls for her husband, bring him home, let him have a little, vaca little vacation. Maybe he'll have relations with his wife and think it's his kid. He's too faithful, he won't do that. Next, he sends him out to the front, tells everybody to back off, and has him killed. Lying, deception, all of that David did. And then in 2 Samuel 12, Nathan now comes to David, who's done these great sins, who's committed these great sins, and he tells this heart-touching story. He tells of a stranger who had a friend come in, or a man who had a stranger come to his house, and he had a lots of flock and a lots of herds, but instead of taking of his own flock and his own herds, there was this man in town who had this, only had one ewe lamb, and he loved it like a kid. He went and got that one man's lamb, killed it, slaughtered it, and fed it to that stranger who came to his house when he could have taken it from the hundreds he had. And David gets enraged. Whoever this man is, he's going to repay tenfold in essence, he says. He's angered at what this one man did. And Nathan then, on the heels of that anger, Nathan says, you're the man. And David realized, I did that. I took something that wasn't mine, and I hurt other people in the process. And he repented of that, and he made it right. And Psalm 51 is all about David making that right in his life. And yet other things occur because of this sin. David's family suffered greatly because of his sin with Bathsheba. War would not depart from his house, he's told. 2 Samuel 12 through 20, you see that? Absalom, his own son, rises up against David, does great things against him. Uh, we know another area in which David sinned was his unauthorized census of the people. 2 Samuel 24, David made a census among the people, and the context seems to be to maybe see his own power. God didn't tell him to do this. He wanted to do it to see his own power. Maybe pride got in his heart. We don't know all the details, but as a result, we know 70,000 people died in three days because of David's unauthorized census that he made. And so when I think about the life of King David, you know, he was a great man of God, man after God's own heart, did a lot of good things for God and his kingdom. All the other kings of Israel are kind of held up to his standard, but he wasn't perfect. He did some things that were bad, and he did some things that were ugly. And friend, doesn't that remind us all of our life from time to time? Is my life perfect, and is your life perfect? Certainly not. Do we all have times in our life where we've done good things and we're proud of those? Sure. But do we have times where we did bad things that we wish we hadn't done 
and then done some really ugly things that we know we really, really shouldn't have done. All of us have times like that in our life. And friend, if, if that describes your life right now especially, the good news is the seed of David, Jesus Christ, He came to take away sin. You'll call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. If you've got bad and ugly in your life that you've never dealt with, friend, that's what Jesus Christ is here to do. He came to save people from their sins. He's able to save to the uttermost completely those who come to God through Him. Hebrews 7, verse 28 and 29. And so we urge you today, if you're not a Christian, why not become one? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is something you must obey. For Romans 6, 17 and 18 says, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you are delivered. Have you obeyed the teaching of Jesus Christ on salvation? You say, well, what is that teaching? What are you talking about? Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? Jesus clearly said, unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. Are you willing once you've believed in Christ to repent of sin and turn to God. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Have you turned from sin to God? Are you willing to confess with your mouth Jesus as the Savior? Romans 10 verse 10 says, With the heart we believe unto righteousness, the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch, are you willing to say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Then, friend, to have every sin washed away, would you obey what God says about baptism? Jesus said this. It's so plain, so simple. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Peter preached, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Saul of Tarsus was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You see, we contact the death and blood of Christ in the point of baptism. Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 says, And so if you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we're, we're pleading with you, we're urging you today to do that. Become a man of God or a woman of God by obeying the gospel and living faithful to Him. If you're not a Christian, do that. If you are, then we want to encourage you to keep walking in the light. And we hope and pray that you'll join us next time as we're going to think about another great Bible character of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the